personnel hurriedly complete the customer information with minimal and sometimes inaccurate information. We identify the poor data quality when business managers to profile or segment customers, resulting in expensive cleanup processes. Doing it right the first requires knowledge of the information value chain and the organizational value of data. Extending solutions to customers started with digital telephony networks that enabled data transmission with modems. In Nigeria, these private networks were often limited and expensive and also dedicated for corporate use. However, software distribution costs also, and maintenance of updates were determined to scale, warranting an alternate model. This period coincided with the emergence of dynamic websites connect using internet browsers. Today, Chrome, but those of us that started, started with the foreigners of Netscape and Mosaic and the like. Other architectures complementary to the internet in interconnectivity emerged. Intranets and extranets providing inter and inter intra and inter-organizational dist distribution of web-based content and the need for customer centricity. The customer-centric era, also known as the information age, started in the 2000s with a focus on customer value creation. The ubiquity of technology devices also increased the number of users and their access locations. As we now know, technology is no longer synonymous with a group of specialists locked away in a computer room, but is everywhere and with everyone. Because technology is with everyone, ease of use is a sought after characteristic in software selection decisions. Personally, this confuses me because ease is an individual trait dependent on many factors. The user considerations solution builders have to contend with are not only many but diverse. Solution providers must understand the dynamics of user-centered user design which encompasses customer behavior and incorporate these concepts into their products, uh, digital products and services. Hence, beyond product functionality, considerations that address user interface and experience are integral to the product acceptance and use. What am I building? We're building technology solutions which comprise of software or hardware. The processes or activities involved in building technology solutions varies for business entities and technology entrepreneurs. Typically, technology entrepreneurs build a product from ground up, while business entities either build or procure an off-the-shelf solution. Hence, we may exemplify the build process as innovation. Innovation is the action or process of innovating, changing something established by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. Innovation is synonymous with digital technologies. While these innovations result in a vibrant technology entrepreneurship ecosystem, they are yet to disrupt traditional industries or address new markets, new or excluded markets. Should, they be, should our focus be on disruptive or frugal innovation? The late Harvard Business School professor, Clayton Christensen, describes the disruptive innovation as an innovation that creates a new market and value network and disrupts an existing market or value network, displacing established market leaders and alliances. However, their disruption capacity depends on additional exogenous and endogenous factors. We know that in emerging markets, for the large populations and constraints such as infrastructure, poverty, weak institutions, and many more. These limitations have excluded a significant segment of the populations from access to a wide range of services. In such markets, innovations that address such exclusions or non-consumption are frugal innovations that create new value propositions and missed affordability, resource, and institutional constraints are essential. When looking at the business as an entity, as a business entity as the builder, as a commercial business entity, my introduction to, of technology is to enhance the business. This could be in the form of competitiveness, operational effectiveness, or productivity, or even financial gain. Also, it could just be for the fun of it or for the copycat kit syndrome. The decision triggers a series of activities in the organization. First is the allocation of financial resources and their conversion into tangible IT assets, 
hardware, software licensings, and communication networks. Second is the actual deployment or installation and implementation that is now termed digital transformation. This transformation requires digital capabilities and practices and organizational redesign based on the existence of a clear vision on the role of technology. Aligning business and IT technology and practice required in building digital solutions. Alignment refers to synchronization of technology and business. Conceptualizing this strategic use of technology is not a business, but is not a technical, but a business function. The owners of this role, business-focused IT leaders, need deep knowledge of the business and industry, the environment and global and local practices to formulate strategic innovations. In addition, they need to plan IT expenditure, ensure IT delivers benefits, and foster partnerships. In this era of the fourth industrial revolution, Establishing and institutionalizing digital innovation capabilities will form part of the strategic alignment process. While strategic planning responsibilities are the, are the responsibility of the chief information officer, the overall oversight responsibility of IT systems and information assets belongs to the board of gov directors and executive management. IT governance enforces the relationship between the strategy and the desirable behaviors of information and IT assets. The outputs of the digital strategy are a series of digital initiatives that will be purchased and implemented. We base purchasing decisions for hardware and communications on technical specifications. In addition, these decisions should be future-looking, factoring in the environment and maintenance capabilities. Software purchase decisions, on the other hand, are more complex. As illustrated in the decision tree, the criteria of consideration starts with the decision of either to replace or the existing solution or maintain status quo. Having decided the actual purchase will require further evaluation across technical, business, and commercial dimensions. At this stage, negotiation skills will come in handy to ensure we attain the best commercial terms and conditions. Several IT projects evolve upon agreement of terms and conditions, and managing the individual projects and digital strategy in its entirety will require significant effort. Nonetheless, getting employees to use this solution again begs the question, if I build it, will they come? Because functional training, change management processes that seek to build the right mindset and capacities should not be overlooked. Notwithstanding the change management embedded within the IT project's implementation, the continuous development of digital skills and user competencies should become a core component of organizational-wide learning and development practices. Building digital capabilities and practices is one half of the transformation. The other half is organization redesign. Introducing digital technology changes, changes the organization, warranting the design of components like structure, culture and beliefs, people, jobs, teams, and business processes, to mention a few. All in all, the transformation may result in an entirely new business model. The ubiquity of technology has implications for the business and on the digital transformation journey. Yet, while organizational culture plays such an integral part in the technology adoption, there is no cookie-cutter approach. But one approach that seems to drive adoption is top-down, CEO leadership. Having a digital leader at the top drives the adoption across the organization. I recall a, gov after a report from a government power startup that, that deployed an enterprise email solution. In that organization, the directors had forwarded their training request to the chief executive for approval using conventional memos. After weeks of radio silence, they challenged the CEO, and he smugly informed his directors he had communicated their approvals by email. I'm sure a lot of us can exchange similar stories, but what's clear is that the leader sets the tone. If, technolo if the technology function is strategic in the organization, then the ownership of the business strategy, which includes the use of technology, is that of the CEO, with the support of the CIO. As a startup, we are building digital technologies that will transform. We are the innovators. 
The high unemployment numbers in Nigeria, combined with access to technology knowledge, has created a new group of technology entrepreneurs. While the focus is on building solutions, this cannot be equivalent to building a technology venture or business. Such ventures require business structures and a customer value proposition, as well as a plethora of business and management skills. To address such skill such shortages, third-party interventions and the nature of support provided include in investors, hubs, accelerators, and incubators. Business management skills and competencies in the following areas are also necessary. People management, operations management, corporate governance, and market sizing. Will they come? We have introduced the producers and users of digital technologies and explained the development activities. The next question is, will they come? To a commercial entity, the question is, will my employees and customers or suppliers adopt the digital solution? For the technology venture, the question is, will my target customer segments buy and use the solution? Alternatively, will my venture attract investors? Or will I become an African unicorn? As a tech investor, this question is, will I lose my shirt? Answers to questions on adoption and utilization have been explained through Roger's diffusion of innovation theory that clearly identifies five decision-making stages. It's not rocket science, but users may not adopt our solutions for different reasons. Beyond adoption and utilization, a secondary question is embedded in the overall theory of change, addressing what are the benefits of the investment or business, of the investments to business and or society. This is the real reason of technology investment and digital transformation. The extent to which we are certain technology's contribution to organizational performance is dependent on metrics used, if any. In 2003, Harvard Business Review published Nicholas Carr's controversial article, IT Doesn't Matter where he challenged IT's strategic importance given its commoditization and associated impact measurement difficulties. In plain English, the existence of systems and processes to measure cost savings, productivity improvements, customer satisfaction, etc., did not exist. It's not about what you buy, it's about how you use it. Permit me to explain the use of technology for social good through the, lens of, through the financial inclusion lens. Simply put, financial inclusion is access to and availability of affordable formal financial services. Mobile telephony and the high adoption rates redefine the financial inclusion landscape, where access to non-bank accounts catapulted with mobile money. Here, providing digital financial services to the underserved is not just about economic performance but for the provider, but also about addressing socioeconomic gaps and risks arising from the lack of access to formal financial services. Technology's incursion into the industry is complemented by new business models, a new segment of businesses across diverse industries bearing the tech suffix have emerged. These are the fintechs, the ag techs, the civic techs, the ed techs, health techs, and so on. Notwithstanding the industry, the, at the heart of these businesses is the delivery of customer value and the growth of inclusive markets and inclusive development. My technology story has introduced the people producing digital solutions and the buyers as opposed to the users and employees whose interactions with technology have evolved over time. I have also explained the activities pertinent to building digital products and services and digital transformation. Finally, technology deployment goes beyond adoption. They should deliver impact to either business and to or society. So I've told my story and I'm certain you're all wondering how this relates to me. Well, the pursuit of answers and explanations to if I build it, will they come? has defined my academic and professional life. Let me explain. IT is complex, technical, and boring, and also poorly communicated. As such, creating explanatory notes to demystify technology, its application and diffusion has been one of the things I've focused on. 
developing notes that relate to IT in supply chain management, IT in banking, key global, key IT issues, both global and local, and also digital platforms in Africa. Another intervention area is supporting IT in business and strategy formulation and developing business and management capabilities. Though most technology entrepreneurs and colleagues focus on the digital products and services, the internal capability of technology enterprises remains neglected. Working on a World Bank initiative, Management in a Box, we identified the management capabilities required by Nigerian IT and IT-enabled organizations. The initial framework of the strategy, operations, and finance triangle was efficient in Spain. However, its portability across markets, especially in emerging market economies, required further investigation. The SOF HR plus M framework emerged, including HR and marketing knowledge to the original trio of strategy, operations, and finance. Independently, IT offers minimal business value but its enablement capabilities are transformational and impactful when deployed and utilized. Because there is no transformation without adoption, the thrust of my work has focused on investigating demand-side adoption in private and public sector, focusing on business IT alignment, management practices and standards, describing and reinventing business models, technological, organizational, and environmental factors inhibiting adoption and usage, identifying issues related to moral reasoning in IT decisions. Digital technology adoption is not widespread in Nigeria's diverse economy, unfortunately. But the financial services industry has broken boundaries through technology innovations. While we are cognizant of the industry's imperfections, we also need to celebrate the small wins, like instant payments and account number validation, which more advanced markets are yet to deploy. These innovative solutions addressing local resource and strengths are demonstrations of our innovation capabilities. The financial services industry that introduced online real-time banking has evolved. Today, the point of convergence is digital financial services or providing financial services using digital technologies and channels. This is clear in the expanded banking and payments ecosystem with actors such as non-bank financial institutions and financial technology companies. In September 2019, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion convened a global policy dialogue on inclusive fintech, spearheading discussions on the regulatory and supervisory approaches for these new entities. In Nigeria, we see regulatory authorities like the CBN transitioning with new structures, regulatory instruments, and licensed categories whilst, while still focusing on financial system stability and integrity and financial inclusion. My entry into financial inclusion started with my doctoral work on retail electronic banking performance and identifying the dimensions of electronic banking quality. I launched proper into financial inclusion with a small research grant from the Institute for Money, Technology and Financial Inclusion of the University of California to conduct a demand-side study on mobile money utility and financial inclusion in Nigeria and Ghana. Whilst there, were perceived need for, there was a perceived need for mobile money and formal financial services in both markets, factors like trust, awareness, product suitability, accessibility, and so on limit adoption. Fast forward to 2016, when we commenced work on our first grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to provide an evidence base for financial inclusion in Nigeria. This resulted in establishing the Sustainable and Inclusive Digital Financial Services Initiative. And between 2016 and 2019, the SIDFS Research Almanac, the State of the Market Report, has highlighted demand and supply side insights on financial inclusion. Through additional funding from BMGF in 2019, we are building a DFS observatory to mobilize private sector intervention entities and advocating for policies that support and enhance the DFS adoption by the unbanked poor. This work stream is a classic use case for the use of technology for social good and change. In the annual state of market reports, we have provided insights and models for developing sustainable business models identifying supply-side capabilities 
market enabling policies, and the nexus of financial inclusion and key macroeconomic indicators. We have evidence that private sector institutions, private sector financial inclusion in interventions are also a catalyst for attaining at least six sustainable development goals. Financial inclusion is, not a, socioeconomic, is a socioeconomic phenomenon that impacts beyond financial services industry. Given this relative cross-sectoral impact, we should leverage our resources and optimize financial inclusion interventions to attain socioeconomic development. However, financial inclusion is not the only social dimension where IT's impact is significant. These trends are clear in the agriculture and retail sectors. In agriculture, market information systems that facilitate access to markets and reduce information asymmetries in the value chain and improve the livelihoods of smallholder farmers are one emerging ag tech category. Likewise, e-commerce ventures and marketplaces have provided access to markets to a wide range of retailers and altered retail buying and selling patterns as well. SIDFS's incursion into market enabling policies for DFS and financial inclusion were a learning opportunity in the policy making space. Combining doctrinal and policy analysis with stakeholder consultations, we facilitated the process of identifying market enabling policies in six key focus areas. In academia, our ability to convene and facilitate private, public private fora conduct background research and contribute to exposure drafts are critical and all important roles. The policy space in Nigeria and Africa is the next frontier. I'm currently on that horse with engagements in DFS and financial inclusion and digital transformation. Examples of some of the things that I've dabbled in include providing feedback on Nigeria's payment system vision 2030, conducting background research on DFS and regulatory sandboxes, and public cloud computing, visioning for national digital transformation and cloud computing, taking part in national strategic fora on digital identity and cloud computing. In seeking impact, we cannot do that without basic understanding of the economic environment and economy. And given technology's multidimensional scope, this requires holistic architecting, diligent implementation, and effective collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, I will attempt to answer the question, and these are my opinions, which you may or may not agree with. Irrespective of the organizational outcome or social phenomenon, adopting technology solutions and the assurance that if I build it, they will come is unfounded. An affirmative response heavily depends on other complementary actions that are the digital transformation journey. Digital technologies their adoption and utilization for impact requires structured processes and practices, which albeit painstaking, are the missing middle to my question, if I build it, will they come? Within a corporate or government entity, deploying technology and embarking on the digital transformation journey, success lies in how the technologies are selected adopted and used, not what is purchased. Appropriate and effective adoption, you, ad adoption and use requires leadership, organizational redesign, and the commitment to building interna internal digital capabilities. Frankly, this change may be laborious and disruptive, warranting new organizational attributes and attitudes like agility, inclusiveness, and test and learn approaches. Whether a corporate entity, government, or technology venture, it's the push versus pull dichotomy. It's the push to deploy technology based on its availability and ubiquity or addressing a genuine constraint, need, or problem. Technology ventures building a business solution or infrastructural technologies must understand that the product is not a business. The product catalyzes a business that can continue to maintain and develop solutions whilst also distributing and capturing new markets. Besides these, the infrastructural technology providers also need protections like copyrights and licenses. Technology investors don't want to lose their capital. In, they don't want to lose their capital. In commercial ventures, it's about higher valuations, building unicorns. In the social space, it's about impact. 
Let's build it for them to come. Let's use technology to solve problems and change our country. So ladies and gentlemen, how do I take this forward? Do I hang my robe and say it is finished? Or do I define project what next? Technology transformation in Nigeria should not be devoid of an enabling environment and policies that create, promote, and support sustainable national digital transformation. The future lies in research and advocacy for the right policies and effective regulatory practices, stimulating technology entrepreneurship that will lead social and economic impact. Adequate policies will provide the guidelines and structures for a secure and resilient digital Nigeria that will stimulate innovation, investment, innovation, investment, and create jobs across the ecosystem. I believe the possibilities are endless, but we can liken the hidden part to an iceberg where the visible tip only represents 20 to 30 percent of the whole. Despite technology opportunities and talent in Nigeria, our ability to leapfrog will require the right complement of digital infrastructure and policies. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned earlier that I have already mounted the horse. Although a novice, I am trotting and hopefully will start galloping soon. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So I didn't do this alone. On May 24, 2018, I gained the full understanding of the value of a mother. And I can say without any doubt that I am because of her. God used my mother to orchestrate all this. I never wanted to study computer science. <laughs> I wanted to study accounting. But my mother filled my jam form and said, you're studying computer science at Unilag. And I said, OK. So be it. She could not be wrong. And she was not alone. My father joined forces with her. And he played both sides supporting her completely while providing me with palliatives. He saw I had all the resources for my course of study. In his own words, how can you be studying computer and not have one? So from the first day in Unilag, I had my own personal computer and Amstrad 8086. I obeyed and completed my course of study in computer science. And I am ever so grateful to both of them. My parents, Dejani Bilona Femi Pierce, played the pivotal roles of direction setting of visioning and resource provision. Without sufficient resources, we can never accomplish a vision. Sadly, they both passed away in 2018. And in their honor, kindly indulge me and rise for a moment's silence. May God continue to grant them eternal rest. Amen. My family is an awesome group of individuals that provide encouragement and support to persevere through life's highs and lows. They are the enabling environment. In my life, these are my siblings and their spouses, my aunties and uncles, my cousins, nieces, and nephews. 
Though I was part of one enabling environment, I merged with another and spawned one of my own, my core. They give me wings to fly, standing by me amidst many evil stares, raised hands and shushes. Thank you for getting me here. Friends and their friendship, love and support. From the day I announced my doctoral intentions, some found it hard to understand why I would commit to a five-year program. But you steered the course with me, graciously tiptoeing around my schedule. I don't, take your, I don't take you for granted and appreciate your patience and encouragement. In the last 30 years, my professional ecosystem of colleagues, partners, and collaborators has grown. Starting with the leadership of Tara Systems and Shaney Williams, who took me under his wing, the doyen of banking, Ayola Gudoye, and the trio of Albert Alos, Juan Alejido, and Inacio Canedo, who hired me. To my peers on the faculty, colleagues and partners I have worked with on various projects, the diverse experiences have provided unique learning opportunities for which I am eternally grateful. Some of you went a step further, keeping me honest with thought-provoking provo intellectual discussions at speaking engagements or over coffee, juice, mojitos, and the occasional single malt. In my almost 17 years at LBS, I appreciate the many inspiring managers who allowed me to test my theories and ideas. Finally, even if I build it, they may not have come. They may not come, but you all have come, and I thank you. And before I leave, I would like to say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God bless you all. Please be seated. Thank you. No doubt, some members of the audience may have questions. But unfortunately, for some reasons, people don't ask questions at inaugural lectures. <laughs> Please feel free to interact with the professor during the cocktail immediately after this formal event. And so, without much ado, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, we have come to the end of this event. I thank you all for your presence and wish you safe journey messages back to your destinations. We implore all guests to please remain in the auditorium while the procession exits in reverse order. Please, let's rise for the university and national anthems. Thank you. We ask God's help.